Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're a week into the era of Daryl Sutter, the second era of Daryl Sutter, and the Flames put up a pretty good week this week. It was a uh, a week with six points on the table, and they got five of them. So not too bad. Matt, why don't we start breaking these down? Well, it was a very good week. Uh, a definite departure over the last month for the Calgary Flames. When's the last time that we left only one point on the table during a week? Oh, I can't I, even remember. Uh, possibly Probably. last season. <laughs> I can say not this season. Yeah. Well, the last game before Daryl Sutter came in, we knew he was coming. The threat of Daryl Sutter was there, but he was not behind the bench last Sunday, which was recorded shortly after our last show. Uh, the Ottawa Senators were in Calgary to finish off their, their little series that they had, and Ottawa got their fifth win in eight straight games as the Calgary Flames fell 4-3 to three in, uh, in extra time. They actually went to a shootout on this one. I'll give my thoughts on this first. Just a note that uh, Levo and Nordstrom were out, and that that brought in uh, Bennett and Ronaldo, uh, who were dressed in this game instead. Gio scored his first goal in 13 games on this one, um, which is probably due for the captain. And I thought the Calgary looked like the Calgary Flames in the first period. They started the second really well, and I thought Ottawa took over around the middle of that period. But then the third period is how the Flames really need to play. If you took the first period from the Edmonton game before this and the third period from this game, now you just got to find a good second period and you're stringing together, you know, a good Flames hockey game. But that third period I thought was really good for the Flames. Yeah, and um, it's just unfortunate that they lost this game in the shootout because – with how much they dominated the third period, frankly, they deserved to get the win. Um, but you know, you can't. But you can't let... win by playing twenty game, twenty minutes of a game. No, and it's one of those where you know, if you didn't get down three one in the first place, then you know, and yeah. I, I thought the Flames got what they deserved. They came back late, they got down early, but they still managed a point out of this, and I think that's about what you deserve for this effort. Yeah, um, all in all, I think that like it, it was a marked improvement from where the games were under Jeff Ward. Even though like they lost both the games under Huska, like it just wasn't anywhere. Like there was more life and vigor and vitality to the team. It was just still a work in progress, very much. And and, with, and who knows what the coaching was here? I mean, Huska's not going to step in and change anything. I wouldn't be surprised if what the guys were were coached on here, and I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was, you know what, guys, I'm not going to tell you what to do in this one. Go out there and show Daryl what you can do. Yeah, and like Daryl was uh, video conferencing with everybody until like during the practices and such, which is helpful, but not all the way helpful and do you remember big bang theory when they had sheldon on that stick when he was video conferencing they need to put one of those on skates so you could just whip around the saddle on ice while they're practicing yeah move those legs <laughs> that's right or if somebody just push it around yep um and then the flames had three days off daryl sutter joined the team on monday so they had three days to prepare uh for the next game with daryl sutter at the helm and the next game after this was the Thursday game against Montreal. Montreal, ahead of us in the standings right now, came into town to play the Flames, and the Calgary Flames ended up winning that game 2-1. to one. Um, Remember that Montreal played less than 24 hours before this one. And the interesting note here, Matt, all Flames skaters were used in the first, I believe it was three and a half minutes of this game. That's crazy to think about. Yeah, well, the Flames, I think that part of... Um the lack of good quality starts is just not being able to get everybody fresh and a shift or two under them right off the bat. And because like, if you're not getting your first shift till like the five or six minute mark, like you're late, you know, from the pregame warmup, your legs are getting a little tired and heavy. And then it takes that much more time to warm back up to get going again. And I, I think that that, partially is a reason why the Flames were having some difficulty in the first period, but, you know, that that's a small thing, but it was good to see that they were cycling through everybody. 
Um, I thought in the first period, Calgary really came at, at Montreal in waves, but they were giving up a lot of turnovers too. And I was kind of cringing by just how many times they seemed to be giving that puck up in the first. Yeah, and you could tell that they were playing the first game under a completely different system. Like, if they were more familiar, I don't think that they would have been nearly as many turnovers uh, just because players didn't quite know where to be still and all that kind of stuff. And, like, it just wasn't... Like, the effort level was there, but not so much the execution part. Josh Levo gets uh, his second and third goal as a flame in this game. He scored the only two goals. Looked like he might get a hat trick at one point. But that Ryan Bennett-Levo line I thought was probably the best line of the night where the Goudreau-Monahan line struggled. And you and I have talked so much over the years about needing you know, good games, not even scoring, but just really good games from your depth. And I think this is one of those games where the, you know, the fourth line was able to come out and do do better for the team when Goudreau and Monaghan were struggling, and that's how you get a win. You can't always rely on that top line. Well, it, exactly, and it's like a contrast between us and the Edmonton Oilers where, you know, you see Dreisaitl and McDavid out there all the time. If we have four lines that are contributing, then the ice time for everybody is less, and so they're, when the game is progressing like late into the third period... Guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan are fresh and still able to go. Like, in this game, Gaudreau had 16.46, Monaghan 16.23, and Lindholm 17.03. Now, normally, like, forwards tend to get, like, 19, 20, 21 minutes. Top forwards, yeah. Yeah, and so, that like, they were getting a lot less. Like, Michael Backlund led all the forwards with 18.17, and... Like, that allowed everybody else just having that ability to be a little fresher and also the depth guys being more engaged. It just allowed a lot more flow from the entire lineup. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, and Daryl even talked about after the game not being able to, I forget his exact words, but I think he said he couldn't rely on one of the lines. And... You know, I, I think that a lot of coaches would have probably swapped some of those guys around to try and keep those quote unquote top lines going. But in this case, I give Daryl a lot of credit for just saying, hey, the top line isn't getting going. Let's just play a different line. Yeah. And that is one of the benefits of Daryl Sutter is that, like, all he has to do is point to a picture of him winning the Stanley Cup twice. And, you know, you want to argue with that. Well,. Do you have that? <laughs> you know, and... He can, he can take one ring off each finger, put them in his ears, and say, I can't hear you. My Stanley Cup rings are in my ears. Exactly. And, you know, pull a Patrick Waugh there. And the key is is that, like, you you see guys, like, say Gaudreau's line was struggling in that game. Having the ability to just say, yeah, you know, you guys are fighting it a bit. You know, we'll just rely on Lucic's line or um, the Bennett line for a little bit more because they are feeling it more. And go, with, you know, and roll all four lines instead. Yeah, and I think as a as a coach, that's always what you want, right? You want to be able to roll four lines. You want that, even if you don't do it, you want the ability to do it. Mm-hmm. And... Like, Calgary, for a long time, frankly, has had some difficulty with almost placating the star players a little too much, and I think that's part of the reason why uh, the Flames have been so disjointed over the last couple of seasons, where, like, effort levels and all of that were not up to snuff, and... Like, having somebody who is a disciplinarian and will, you know, like, do your work type mentality will hopefully navigate around that and get the best out of those players instead of, like, what has been where 
you know, left to their own devices, the the tires just spin in place and the flames don't really go anywhere. And they seem to either get in the past really good play from the top players or really good player play from the depth players. Like even when we were against Colorado in the playoffs a few years ago, we got really good play from the depth and the top guys just seemed to disappear in that series and you need it so that you know in one game maybe the depth guys are taking over and in one game the the um you know top guys are taking over but all together you need to be you need to all be capable of producing well it it's also like like you don't necessarily need to score or create an offensive chance to have a good shift and like if you're controlling the play and being annoying generally to the other team that is, you know, is a huge thing because you're making the job easier for the next line to come out and so on. And like from for like this entire season, like you'd go shift to shift and not really know what you were going to get from this team. And like if the Flames had a really good shift, they'd follow it up with a defensive zone. You know, like they they'd turn it over and they'd be in their defensive zone the next shift. And like there was just no flow at all to their game and now you're starting to see but between both the canadians games more of that sustained getting in your face and confronting the opposition style which leads to more and more like if you look at um the second goal uh that josh levo scored like that was literally a nothing play where under Ward or uh, Peters, like the forecheck wouldn't have happened, which wouldn't have caused the defenseman to get flustered, which wouldn't have caused Weber to get the puck, which if he wasn't under pressure, he wouldn't have made that bad pass. And, you know, then the Flames get a good scoring chance and score the game-winning goal, all just because they were putting pressure on the other team. And, you know... It's just like those little details that can help to spark more and more good things moving forward. And I thought in this game, the Flames looked really dominant in the second. Montreal started to push back in the third, but I thought the Flames, to their credit, were able to hold Montreal off when they pushed back. And how often have we seen a team start to push back and Calgary just stops or isn't able to you know, hold off the onslaught? Yeah, we got the Perry goal. But I just thought that Calgary was able to neutralize Montreal coming back for a lot of that period. And they started to play. It almost looked like shutdown hockey. At one point, it was like, okay, let's just put the third and fourth lines out there and protect our lead. Yeah, and they were just allowing the clock to be burnt down. And like they weren't running around their own zone or doing anything overly stupid. They were just managing the game and, like just letting the plays develop and responding accordingly and just playing smart defensive hockey it, basically in a situation like that you're wanting the other team to have to work so hard to beat you as the forwards or you as the defenseman to set up a play which then they have to go and deal with the Vesna candidate goalie on top of that and like if you can layer these obstacles for the where like they have to fight through the one then the other then the other just to get a good scoring chance like the flames could become really effective at locking games down just because of all of the steps that the other team has to fight through which you know it, it would be more of a hey good on you for actually getting a goal more so than oh you here we it. go again you know you, you managed to get the goal, you earned that goal. Yeah. Well, the next game was Hockey Night in Canada, and I always love, I mean, I know that this year, every night, uh, or every sa Saturday, we get Hockey Night in Canada with two Canadian teams, but it almost feels like we're getting spoiled that way, because in the past, it hasn't always been. But we had Calgary-Montreal in the Dome for Hockey Night in Canada, uh, and the Flames end up winning this one three to one against the Canadians. And Sean Monahan got his sixth and seventh goals of the year. That makes him the seventh player in Flames history to score two hundred goals with the franchise. Good to see from Sean Monahan, who I thought's uh, been struggling a bit this year on the offensive side. 
the other goal in this one from Michael Backlund. So, Matt, thoughts on the Hockey Night in Canada win for the Flames? Well, just to expand on that Monaghan milestone, he becomes the first Flames draft pick to score 200 goals in his career period uh, since Corey Stillman in 1992. Not all 200, the first 200 were with Calgary. And then before that, to get somebody with all with Calgary, it was Theo Fleury in 87. The other three were Al McKinnis, Joe Neuendijk, and Gary Roberts. So quite an impressive milestone for Sean Monaghan. Good company to be in, for sure. Yeah, and I think with uh, the first goal, uh, very much like the Levo goal, just a pure product of hard work and tenacity. That's well said, uh, yeah. By both Richie and Monaghan to just dig the puck out, fight off the defenseman, get the puck off him, skate the puck out in front, and Monaghan with the more prototypical Peter Forsberg type power move from behind the net, skating it out front, getting a good shot away, picking the top corner, and like there was literally nothing Price could do with that shot. It, it was just perfectly placed right at the corner of the crossbar in the post. Like, just an, a good, good effort from Sean Monaghan, which, like, if he can start utilizing himself more like that, he could take that next step. And, you know, that will be interesting to see. Yeah, I thought both goals from Monaghan were good in this one, but you're right, that first one, just a product of hard work and... And that's what you want, right? I mean, as much as, I mean, you'll take a goal over, you can get it in the end, but it's really nice when you can say that was just working hard and getting a goal. And that's that's what gets you wins. That's what gets you into the playoffs is hard work and goals will come out of hard work. Well, and like, that's one of the things that's been a feature of the team. It has been like getting uh, just off of raw skill, just generating goals just from amazing passing plays it, much like the Michael Backlund play where Manjapane deked out the defender put the puck behind the net got it out, made a quick pass to Backlund for a one-timer like just pure skill but the thing that they've lacked frankly has been the tenacity to go and get those garbage goals and I think both Monaghan goals were just a product of nothing plays where Monaghan was in the right place on the power play goal to be standing out in front of the net. When the rebound came to him, he whacked it out of the midair and into the net. And, like, it's just, like, the Flames, in order to take those next steps to try to be a, not only a playoff team, but a team to actually be concerned with in the postseason... They need to be able to generate offense in both, like, just raw skill and hard work. And through the two games, like, three of the uh, five goals that Calgary scored were just product of hard work. And I think that, to me, is a huge... Well, and that just difference. shows an identity shift, if nothing else. It just shows that, you know, if we work hard, we're going to be rewarded. And, and seeing the hard work is not something we're used to with the Flames. Yeah, and like it, that's one of those things that, like, this was part of, like, when I was, you know, suggesting Daryl and all of that. Because the hard work was something that has been lacking. And just the attention to details and the focus and the intensity like every year like i keep saying like the talent levels there like they should be able to do this but the effort level has not matched the talent and through the these first two games and of course it's early if they can keep up this level of determination and effort you're not going to win every game but you're going to make it really hard to get two points out of the Calgary Flames. Let's just pause there about Daryl. Let's come back to what we see different in Daryl, but let's wrap up the week first, and then we'll talk yep. about what's different about Daryl Sutter. Uh, so after that, that puts the Calgary Flames now 28 games in, so officially the midseason point, and 29 points. So, you know, as bad as we've been, or as bad as we perceive that we've been, that means that we're averaging 
pretty much just over a point a game. Um, at this point, that puts us two points down from Montreal, who holds down the final playoff position if the playoffs were today in Scotia North. Uh, they're at 31 points. Edmonton's at 36. Winnipeg's at 36. Toronto at 40. Vancouver's right behind us at 28. But Matt, with games coming up this month, I mean, pretty much every game except for the Ottawa game is against a team that we need to stop from getting points. It feels to me like the Flames could be back, you know, back in the playoff hunt by the end of this month. Well, the, that's the thing. Like, if they're they play the games like they have. It, just for raw talent, Calgary has more raw talent than Winnipeg, than Edmonton, than Montreal, and are basically on par with Toronto. So, if the effort level is matching the talent, it is going to be very hard for those three teams to beat the Flames. And so, Calgary can make up a lot of ground if they keep up play you know and i think that with daryl being daryl yeah the team is going to be (laughs) prepared to come out otherwise facing the wrath of daryl is not you know but um like it it'll be interesting to see especially like now the games are really getting interesting because now you're like at least through the two games you're seeing the effort levels matching the talent and Mm -hmm. Like, that's where, like, oh, this team might actually be something. Where, yeah. it, like, before the firing, it's like, uh, how how fast can we fast forward these, like, 30-some-odd games just so we can get to the draft? Because, like, everybody was kind of on their own page. Nobody was working together. Nobody was cooperating with each other. And it was just a complete mess. And, like, literally what a difference a week makes. So now at the halfway point, let's look at some of the team leaders for the first half of the season. Johnny Goudreau has 11 goals. He leads the team in goals. Elias Lindholm with 18 assists. Elias Lindholm's uh, 18 assists bring him to 24 points total. He's the points leader with 24. Noah Hannafin is our plus-minus leader at plus 6. Johnny Goudreau is our power play goal leader. He has six power play goals. The next one's kind of an, adiz- an abysmal stat. Our shorthanded goal leader is Manjapani with one. Yeah. The uh, the le- the leader for average time on ice is the captain. 21.46 is his average. Face-off percentage winner is Michael Backlund. He wins 54.44, repeating, of course, percent of his face-offs. Uh, Jacob Markstrom has 10 wins. Jacob Markstrom's save percent through half of the season is .911. And Jacob Markstrom has two shutouts. That's where we sit at the halfway point. So, Matt, let's jump back into what you're talking about with the Daryl Sutter game. Outside of the hard work, outside of the, um, you know, sort of the intangibles, this team has looked a lot faster, haven't they? Well, and that's where the effort level comes in. Like, not only are they... Like, the system has changed significantly. Like, the, it, literally, the first time I saw, the, like, the first five minutes of the first Canadians game, I, I was literally getting flashbacks of 4 Just not, like, the results, but just the system and how, like, the, the team just kept coming at waves and waves and waves. And, like, always the Flames players were in the right positions and, like, the sticks were active, and they, they were harassing the Canadians at every turn. And, like, in that first game, they only allowed 18 shots. That was the first time since Bill Peters was the coach that the Flames had given up less than 20 shots. And Montreal just couldn't do anything, because every time they were just... Everybody was on them, on them, on them. And it was relentless and like even like if the talent level struggles a bit the effort level will compensate for that and like you you saw garbage goals being scored like Gaudreau's line frankly struggled in both games and same with the Kachuk line and yet just through hard work they were able to get a couple of goals just from that and you know, collect the win. Like, that, to me, is the biggest change. And I think that... I'd say the bigger one even more than that is a lot less East-West play. Yeah. They seem to be straight in skate lines, back and forth, straight line, back and forth the whole time. 
Yeah, well, and, like, you're not giving anybody any time or space. You're not being cute. You're just... Well, and the other teams haven't had time to set up their... I guess the other teams. It's only been Montreal. But in both games, Montreal hasn't been able to set up their neutral zone forecheck. And that really helps the Flames out, that they're just not giving them that time and space. Yeah. And, like, especially because of the fact that, like, teams in our division are lesser talented, um, that also creates more opportunities to cause turnovers. Just because, like, you can imagine, like, if you had a bunch of guys, like, skating in on Shillington and Valimaki, like, bad things are going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, like, the the problem with guy, teams like Edmonton, Montreal, Winnipeg, like, their second and third pairing defense are not very good. And they are more prone to turnovers or making bad passes and all that kind of stuff, rushing to... Because, oh, there somebody's on them. And, like, th- that, to me, is going to be a huge thing for this team moving forward. Just creating havoc, frankly, for the opposition. And, like, it, it, defensively, I noticed, like, and I've harped on it before, like, if you, you can confront the other team's players and make them, you know, challenge them then, like, one of three things is going to happen. Either it's a draw play where, like, they pass the puck to somebody else, they beat your guy, or they turn it over. Well, if you keep confronting them, eventually they're going to turn the puck over. And I found that in the both games against Montreal, like, the forwards for Montreal had a real hard time because there was sticks on them, bodies on them, all the time, and... Like, it was hard for them to generate any good scoring chances just because everybody was on them as soon as they had the puck. Yeah, I would say one thing I noticed in these games too, though, was uh, the Flames seem less organized in their attacks. They often weren't attacking with a full five-man unit. Um, it seemed like controlled entries were often harder because they were just really focused on dumping it in and then gaining control again. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's a very different system than what we saw them playing under the last couple of coaches yeah well that also how often do we see them try to control the puck in and then get taken away in the neutral zone and go back the other way yeah and i think that like in order for this team to get good at being that four checking team you just need to get the reps in and like they haven't really had uh, a good solid four check since fourteen fifteen, and uh, you know like that that was the last time that I can really recall where line after line would be like just flinging themselves at the opposition and I think that like at times the flames have been too fancy, and like there are times and spaces where like that's applicable. Like, when you get an odd man rush, then, you know, ham it up and try to make the fancy play to score. But when it's a three-on-three, well, just get the puck in and see how it goes. And I think that, like, at times, the Flames would try to do too much, turn it over right at the blue line. By that time, your wingers are too far in the zone because they're trying to gain positioning. So now the other team has an opportunity for an odd man rush. And it just, it, it's not effective overall. And well, I think I'm finding the, the thing I saw in the Montreal game, tell me if this is kind of what you're thinking of or what you're seeing, but the Flames would dump the puck, which would mean Montreal had to go behind their own net to get it. So even though our wingers are going deep, we're still in front of the puck. We're not behind it. We're now the puck's going the other way and we got guys out of position. Exactly. And, like, it, it, it's... like You know, with, Montreal's trying to control it around their goal line and we're setting up at the hash marks. Yeah, and, like, even when the uh, Flames forwards are forechecking, like, they're, they're basically tying up with the defensemen for Montreal. So, like, even if you do turn it over, it's still a three-on-three three heading back the other way instead of a four-on-three or a five-on-three. Yeah. And, and it's a small thing, but... It allows the forwards that are too high to quickly 
try to make up ground where the the Montreal's defensemen are not going to be as desperate to rush up the ice because of the fact that those other guys are there and if the puck gets turned over then they need to be in position for that so and on the flip side even if one forward is too far back if you're pretty confident you can keep the team out of your zone and and get it back in the neutral zone now you've got a guy high Mm -hmm. right so if you can get it back around the blue line and pass it back to your guy who's high coming out of the opposing blue or the opposing uh end you've got a, a better chance to get an odd man rush going back at the goalie exactly and basically what the Flames have done in those two games is just create havoc. And, you know, like, it, if you're always buzzing the other team, like, it's hard for them to settle their game down. And especially with most teams now are very composed and focused. And, like, they have to make the good pass. They skate it up. They make another good pass. If you're causing issues and interrupting the, just the their flow, you know, you're going to be causing turnovers. You're going to be causing bad passes. They're going to have to just dump it in to try and get the puck back, which might not be their style of play. Like, you're just getting them out of their comfort zone, which... In a lot of ways, like, the Flames have always adapted to the other team's style, and, like, that's why, I like, playing down to, like, Ottawa's level, instead of, no, this is how we're playing, beat us. You don't like it, too bad. And, like, what we're seeing out of these two games is more of that assertion of, well, you know, you can try and beat us, but, you know, that's on you to beat us, not will accommodate you what you're doing yeah we've talked to, well and we've talked a lot about how the flames have beat themselves in a couple of games yeah and like i think that with sutter and especially like if they continue to play this buzzing style game that you'll see an end to the flames beating themselves which i think has been more than half of the problem frankly yeah i agree so, I mean, you know, it's a week into the Daryl Sutter era, and I'm not convinced that Daryl Sutter is the right coach for three years with this team. I know he signed a three-year deal, including this year, but I think that if we can get him to start putting the right work environment in place, getting these guys to work hard, getting these guys to play hard, getting them to understand what they need to do, I think that that's where you almost bring him in to, to right the ship, and at some point in his three years, I think you bring in somebody else to take it over. Well, th- that's the thing. I think I talked they're, to you last they're, week they're, about the idea of having a great associate coach. Well, this is where it this conversation depends largely on what the heck the Flames actually do between now and like a year or two from now. Like if they are able to get on that right path where they are doing the right things and have success in the playoffs and you know, like are a legitimate cup contending team like they should be based on talent then i it's one of those where it's not necessarily a good idea to replace sutter because hey it's working sort of like when the kings brought sutter in they won the cup then like two years later they won the the cup again and i think that if the flames are being like say they go to the conference finals or the finals this year presuming that you know like things go according to this whole extrapolation then you're gonna want daryl back next year you're gonna want him back the year after because if you're actually getting the success based off of the talent and the effort then there's no reason to change but if say the flames falter and say miss the playoffs or they waffle again in the postseason and you have to make a whole bunch of alterations to the team like say certain players don't buy in that kind of thing and the team's kind of middling then i think where what you're intimating with like having a good you know like you've got the mess sorted out now let the the new guy 
take those part the baton and run with it. Was and it St. Louis, I think, who had uh, Hitchcock as their like you know coaching advisor, but they brought in the guy who was the heir apparent working under him. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I could see the Flames doing in year three of this contract. And hey, Daryl's still the head coach, but let's bring in a Tim Hunter or that upcoming you know hot coach, whoever it is at that time, and let's bring them in to learn from Daryl continue the same systems and using the same verbiage Daryl does and all that, but let's get a transition year instead of just, well, Daryl's gone, who's next? And then that guy changes things. I think you bring in a guy who Daryl can yeah. mold and shape. The guy's still going to do it his own way, but you bring in a guy to sort of be mentored by Daryl Sutter. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And I, and I think you might even see that guy start to come in next year if it's inside the organization. If not, I think you're planning two years out for who might that be and starting to think about you know your short list. Yeah, I agree. And it it's one of those things that because of where the team is right now, it's hard to determine just based off of we don't know what the results of the next rest of the season is. Because I think that, like, if, like, the Flames have to go into retool mode after this season because, like, the last 28 games were not up to what new expectations are, then, you know, like, that's a different conversation than, like, if, hey, now everybody's working together, blah, 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 team's going and murdering everybody else and let's go into the playoffs like it, it's it isn't different. isn't i think in either way though you've got to look past daryl sutter you've got to look at i think in either case bringing in the next guy and getting that guy ready yeah i think the the difference between them is uh timeline on that like if it's more retool time i think you get that process started for like next season and where like if like you know, say the Flames go to the conference finals, the finals, whatever, then I think that, you know, you push that off another whole year and start that process in the third year. Yeah, and I don't know who would be on that short list, but a lot of that process yeah. is probably also dictated by when their contract is up, right? You would, if your guy's available this year, in either case, you take him because you don't want him to sign long term elsewhere. So I think a lot of that's just dictated by who's your guy and when are they available. Yeah. Well, it's just like Bill Peters, he was under contract. Otherwise, Glenn Gullitson would have been fired mid-season and replaced yeah. with Peters. So, we'll see. It, it, uh, but I think that, um, to like what you were saying, like it's just it'll depend largely on like whether it's next year or the year after that the main drive for that. Yeah, and I mean, I know we're all excited to have Daryl here, but I just think that we need to look at what is the post-Daryl Sutter plan. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, like, I'm hoping that, you know, if, you know, things do go successfully, potentially bringing him back. Or if it doesn't, then, you know, looking at other options and seeing how... At navigating the field, basically, like there, there are so many permutations with, you know, and it's hard, like right now, to see exactly. It, it's just encouraging to start. We're two games in, we got to give this some time. Yeah. Well, Matt, at the beginning of the season, you and I made some predictions for the twenty twenty one season. Should we take a look at them at the halfway point and see how we're doing? Not well, I'm assuming. <laughs> um, well, I don't know if it's us not doing well or the Flames just tanking our predictions, but um, who will be having a breakout season? You thought Andrew Mangiapane. I said Josh Levo, so I'm definitely wrong. I would have to give myself a, at least three quarters of a point because Eat Bread has been really good. Yeah, but I don't know if it's a breakout season or if it was an expected season. So I'd kind of give you half a point because he's looked good, but I wouldn't say that he's broken out. It's not like he's the team leader. True. In anything but shorthanded goals with one. Yay. <laughs> you know, so I, I think Mangiapane is one of those guys, and you and I have talked about him and Dubé a lot of their playing consistently every night, but that's what's expected as an NHLer. Yeah. Well... Uh how would you say? I think that he has cemented himself as a top six forward. What what his next steps are, we'll see. Um, 
Who will struggle this season? I said Johnny Goudreau. I'm obviously wrong because he's leading the team in goals. And you thought David Riddick. Also wrong on that one, I would say. Based on the way that Riddick played six in a row for this team, I'd say that he's far from struggling. Yeah, he. I have to say, yeah, that he Riddick played really well. And we didn't lose uh, those games because of David Riddick, most of them. Yeah, there was one, I think, that one. was... Yeah. But show the, me a goalie who's good in all their starts. Yeah, true. Well, even Markstrom hasn't looked good in every start. Yeah, it was basically the Zagadulin appearance game that was bad. O- yeah. Other than that, Riddick was... And and I would, I would even I would even argue Riddick probably played better than expected during those six games. Well, and the thing is, is that Riddick really needs to continue to play well for himself, and because he is a free agent at the end of the year, odds of him being back are slim, just financial reasons. And so, realistically, like he's wanting to earn himself a job somewhere in the NHL. And whether that's in Seattle, possibly, or otherwise... Two you know, new like, goalie jobs are going to open up. Two guys that aren't currently employed in the NHL will be employed in the NHL next year. Yeah, so like uh, it, there are options available. So if he shows himself to be a good potential starter... Because like, there's still potential starter in him. It's just that Calgary is in a zone where uh, we need to win now, and so we don't have patience for the development side of it. And there's a lot of guys, I think, that are potential starters. I mean, you could argue Koskinen's a potential starter, but on what type of team as well? True. Are you a potential starter for a playoff team? Are you a potential starter for a playoff race team? Or are you a potential starter for a team that just needs to rebuild? Ottawa. Ottawa, (laughs) Buffalo, Detroit... You know, so I think that he's definitely going to have a job in the league as a, let's call him a one, whether that's a one, one A or one B somewhere. The question is just, is he, and I think this is what, what pro scouts are going to have to ask, is he the guy that we strap our playoff rocket to? Yeah, and that's going to be up to him to earn that. And, you know, to his credit, he's looked really good thus far and so good on him and he's doing you know i like david riddick and uh, you know i'm cheering for him career wise and so you know like i'm always excited when he does well because of the fact that you know i'd like him to have a successful nhl career well part of being successful staying healthy and the next question we asked was will both goalies be able to stay healthy i said riddick goes down and someone else gets eight to ten games you said yes so far i mean we've had um, marks them out, but not for any extended length of time, I wouldn't say. So I would say that at this point, both guys have been healthy. Yeah, uh, healthy-ish. Like, uh, re- realistically, Riddick probably would have played two or three of those games anyway. But when, I, when we're talking healthy, I think the qualifier we put in is would we need to bring a different goalie in? So, I mean, we brought, we brought another goalie, and he played one game. So let's call that one game where they weren't both healthy and need and we needed the two goalies yeah true enough you know so i would say that for the most part yeah we've been able to get by with the goalies we have yep uh how many starts for markstrom i said 40 you said 35 so far the 28 game mark markstrom has started 19 games and riddick has started nine games so i think knowing that they knowing that riddick can do it now i think they'll probably be more on the 35 game than the 40 game cycle yeah uh, they'll probably split the difference at 37 or 38, but we'll see. Split the difference with exactly half and switch them out of the 10 minutes through the second period just so everyone's... Yeah, exactly. Everyone's just getting so, exactly just half. To, yeah, just to mess with our predictions. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. You got the guy sitting there with the door open. Ready? Three, two, two one, one, swap. Move Let's it. Go. <laughs> Move it. That's right. Uh, You're too slow. Be- You've ruined everything. <laughs> You owe us four more seconds next game. We're going to start this guy for four seconds and then swap goalies. Um, first call-ups. We had a predict, uh, prediction on defense and forward. Uh, I think we were also talking about I, – I would or actually, I th- we didn't know when we made this who was on the taxi squad. So I had said Shillington and Godden. You said Mackey and Godden. Uh, Shillington and Mackey both ended up on the taxi squad, but Godden was, in fact, the first forward called up, I believe. I don't think he was on the taxi squad, so – um, no. I would say either way, whether he is or isn't, we I would say that we were both right so far because Connor Mackey and Oliver Shillington were technically 
taken off the taxi squad and made active. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a gray area, and I think we both get a point on that. Cause... We will... Before the end of the season, I will have the guys in the war room in Toronto review the footage and see uh, how we're gonna how we're gonna do that. What, was the skate a microscopic filament over the line? That's right. Not? We'll get the and because of that, I mean, technically, if we look at call ups, we'd have to look at the date they were activated or the date they were put on the taxi squad. So we'll get the podcasting war room to take a look at that one for us. Yeah. Uh, first guy traded. I thought it would be Nikita Nesterov. You thought it would be Michael Backlund. And as of right now, halfway through, both are still flames. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. I I really don't know as if there will be any trades. Thus no. Far. I, well, and, and you and I have talked about it. I think the big issue this year is the trade deadline is two weeks before the end of the season. So if you're going to make an out-of-Canada trade... You, there's really no point because that guy doesn't help you in the playoffs. So I think it's just going to be, let's say it's Vancouver and Ottawa. Let's say Vancouver, Ottawa, and one other team not in the playoffs. Montreal, say. Sure. I just think it's everybody trading with those three teams. Yeah, and like frankly... And at that point, you're not going to trade a veteran. It's going to be, you know, give us... It's pretty much going to be, you know, prospects or veterans coming to the team for picks. Yeah, and frankly, like of those three teams, the main... Two players, frankly, are Artem Anisimov and uh, Corey Perry. And I think that Corey Perry would probably be the number one target for the Flames, just identity-wise, and, and the fact that he's a right winger. So, you know, that would basically be the only realistic trade I could see the Flames making. Last game, we saw Michael Backlund on the third line. And I think if he stays as the third line center for the next 28 games, the majority of them, I do think that he'll probably be moved in the offseason. I think it's a very expensive third line center. It, and I think th if you're trying to bring a guy like Godin in or somebody like that, you'll want to free up that position. Yeah, it. Just, I think it more depends on like what Derek Ryan does the rest of the way. Because realistically like if Derek Ryan plays adequately enough where you could have him as the third line center for a year or two beyond this year uh, you, you could get away with moving backland without a huge huge drop off to Derek Ryan and you know like it wouldn't be ideal but you know you could manage basically doing it that way and well, and I also think, and we've talked about this in the past, depends where they see uh, Lindholm. Is Lindholm a right winger? Is Lindholm a center? Because that changes where Backlund is in the depth chart as well. Yeah, and it also depends on, like, well, frankly, how infatuated Daryl Sutter is with how Michael Backlund plays. And, like, to me, Backlund being one of the best defensive forwards in the NHL, I can see arguments on both sides, like... Frankly, like, Backlund is a value for dollar contract. Like, he is being paid $5 million, but he is worth $5 million. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's not like the Flames have a ton of options coming up through the organization right at this second to be a legitimate replacement for a, a good third-line center Michael Backlund type. And... Like, Connor Zari might, but, like, even then, like, it's three-ish years away before, you know, he could realistically do that. And well, and part of the question, too, at that point is going to be who's available in free agency, right? If we can get a similar player for two million less, that might be the way to go as well. Yeah. Everything depends. <laughs> Where will the Flames finish the regular season in the Canadian division? I thought third, you thought first. I think we can both say at this point they're not finishing first. I would not agree with that. You still think the Flames are going to... Is this your realistic prediction, or is this your every year Matt thinks they're going to win the Cup prediction? I think Toronto is going... I think they got off to a hotter start than what they actually are, and I think that they're going to slide back... And I I just am not intimidated by Winnipeg or Edmonton. So We're only like, 11 yeah, points out from Toronto right now. You know, like, the Flames do play Toronto quite a bit. I think they still have seven games against the Leafs. Uh, like, in a normal season, I would say no. Like, 
frankly, them leapfrogging Montreal and maybe catching Winnipeg or Edmonton. But because of the fact that everybody's playing each other every night, that every game is a four-point game. And I think it makes it a lot easier for a team like Calgary to jump up and overtake teams than under normal circumstances. And, like, if the Flames... Frankly, like, if the Flames play as they have against Montreal and, well, both games, like, it's going to be very, very difficult for the opposition to beat Calgary. Like, it's going to take a lot. And Yeah, like, I agree with you, but I also think that we have seen, what, two good games since this coaching change. We're a long way from saying this team is rehabbed. No, I know, and I'm not arguing that. But... Um, like, of the 28 games, like, could the Flames win 20, 21, 22 of those? Yeah, I could see it. All right. Well, if you still you think know, that I, you know, I think uh, like that, I, I, there's, there's possible and realistic. Possible to be first, yes. Realistic, I'm not going that far yet. I think third is more realistic for them right now. I would it, agree. It's not as though we're the only team trending upwards. Well... Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I tend to disagree with you there, but, you know, it, it, yeah. I mean, Winnipeg is trending upwards. They don't, they're not having a, you know, a huge trend upwards, but I would say that they're looking better than they did at the start. Yeah. Ed, Edmonton is, is looking surprisingly better than they should, and we've said that for a number of seasons. Like, it's not like Montreal, Edmonton, and Winnipeg, and Toronto were all falling, and we're the only team going on the elevator the other way. Yeah, well, like if you take out the Ottawa games, Calgary and Edmonton have the exact same number of points. So, you know, like that's been the difference, really. And, you know, like I just, like Montreal, I think, is going to miss the playoffs. I, I, they, they just don't have the, the depth. And, like, you know, if Toffoli slows down at all, like they're done, basically. And, um, Edmonton and Winnipeg, like the, See, Winnipeg and, probably. And I think, like you were saying, you're not intimidated against Winnipeg. I think Calgary can beat Winnipeg, but we've got to then look at who can Winnipeg beat. Yeah, true. Right? It's not like we just play Winnipeg all season or just Edmonton all season. And while you're right, we can win those games. This season's a grind as well. Like you look at the schedules, it's a lot different than your regular schedule. Yeah. I know. I I still think that Calgary could win twenty one, twenty two of those games. It just, you know, we'll see. And uh, like I I'm, how'd you say? I have full confidence that like Calgary, in terms of talent, is one of the, like basically either best or second best in the entire NHL. And it's been the lack of effort, frankly, holding them back. So if they're getting both. You know, I could see them being, like, on a 40-plus point pace the rest of the way. And I guess maybe I'm look, I'm a little more cautious saying, show me you've got both. We did it yeah. for two games, but let's have this discussion this time next week after we have six games with Daryl Sutter under our belt, and I think that's a better indication. Yeah, I agree. Did the Flames play well because of Daryl? Did they just play well because they were feeling good and Montreal was tired? Like... Let's let's get a couple more games in before we start saying that they're going to be top in the Scotia division. Oh, I agree. Uh, I'm just yeah. I I still think they have it in them. That's what I'm. We'll see. Like everything, it depends. And um, I, I think first, second, third are more likely. I don't think they just squeak into fourth. Um, just because of the fact that like I I'm expecting one of Edmonton or Winnipeg to fall right off of quite a bit. So, like, I, frankly, Edmonton, I'm expecting to fall off a cliff uh, just due to the fact that they have two players and they're playing, like, every other day. <laughs> uh, if you had a perfect season this year, you'd have 112 points. When we were predicting the number of points, you thought 74, which would be 37 wins. I thought 68, which would be um, 34 wins. I think either one is still very doable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, like that, getting thirty-five points. Um, yeah. 
37 wins would be because 74 divided by 2 would be 37. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, you might get one, two, one point, two point there, but if we just look at it as purely two point games, right? That'd be 37 wins in a 56 game season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it's doable. I think that, like, them finishing with around 70, 71 points is on the upper end, but I think it's. Easily Based on doable. where we are now, I think we'll be a 65 to 70 point team. Yeah. And I think playoffs are more likely than not. I, I, Frankly, I think that the Flames will be better than Montreal the rest of the way. Well, that was the next question. How far do the Flames go in the playoffs this year? I said we go to the third round and lose. You, as you have for as many years as I can remember, predicted Stanley Cup here. Being realistic about what we've seen from this team... Do you still expect the Flames to capture the Stanley Cup? If the Flames play, continue to play the way that they have, then frankly, I think that the Flames win the Stanley Cup. And it just based on the fact that Daryl Sutter's teams, when they have talent and the effort, they are very, very difficult to beat. And, like, it when they lose like it it's hard for the other team to get by them and you know looking at our division like in a playoff series like if Calgary is like full Monte going like honestly even Toronto I couldn't see Toronto beating that in a seven game series and then conference finals, it just depends on who you're playing at that point. And finals, same thing. Like, it, you know, I... It, again, prefacing it, if what we saw in those two games and the effort level and the ability of the players continues to perform, then if they regress back to wishy-washy BS than first round fodder but it you know i just I, from you know like i've been a fan of daryl sutter as a coach back when he was with chicago so like i like how he does his thing and like his teams are always always a hard team in the postseason so it, and then you add calgary's just raw talent into it and like, if Calgary was basically, like, you swap the talent level with, say, Montreal or Winnipeg, then, you know, I would be a lot more like, well, probably they could win a series, but but with the fact that the Flames have the amount of talent that they do, it's not, oh, well, they might, it's really they should. And but you're still hanging your hat that this team is Stanley Cup could be a Stanley Cup contender still. If they play the way they have. And, like, uh, frankly, if you have everybody pull... Like, that's basically been the problem for the last three seasons, is that the team hasn't been pulling in the same direction. And, like, everybody's been on their own page, and they get completely flustered any time any adversity happens, and they haven't dictated the play. And, like, if the Flames are dictating the play like they have, and getting the other team off of their game then you add the fact that the flames are one of the more talented teams like it, it makes it it's like if a team beats the flames it'll be full marks to them for beating calgary not like how like the colorado series or the dallas series where Calgary could have beat Dallas, but they gave it away. Or even this or, season when Ottawa got some wins over us because we beat ourselves. Yeah. It, like, if, if the Flames get out of their own way and just make the other team have to work for it, realistically, Calgary should be winning most of the time. It's just, you know, it. that's the problem with this team, though, is that, yes, two good games, that's great we haven't seen enough and like frankly talk to me at game 40 about this and the picture will be a lot clearer yeah it's still, a lot, just, still a lot of questions to be answered you know but just based off of what i've seen and knowing like the kings 
or the Flames from when the two years that Daryl did coach the team. Like, if the team is pulling all in the right direction at the same time, and the effort levels there, and just the raw intrinsic talent that they have, add all those factors together, like, it, it, you know, like, the other team can win. So in a nutshell, it, you're, you think yeah. that it's possible if they keep playing the way they're playing? Oh, I I would actually lean more towards probable to conference finals or beyond. And Done. All right. We, we got your – we were just yeah. going in a circle on that one, so let's move on. Yeah. Um, unexpected playoff hero we won't get into because we can't evaluate that at the halfway point, but I said Valimaki, you said Manjupani, so I'll hold that one off till the very end. What do the Flames need to do to be successful for this season? I said consistency. They need to start on time every night and not go on a losing streak, and you said not wavering from playing their game. And I think what you were just talking about with the Stanley Cup, what it's going to take for them to win that cup, I think that's – both of those are right on point, right? They need to play their game. They need to play their game all night, and they need to be winning games. Yeah. And dictating the play and just making life hell for the other team. Like, that's all that they have to do. And, like, we saw with Montreal, they never got a foothold, really, throughout the two games. And I think the Flames outshot them 70-43 to 43 in those two games. So, like, or 41, pardon me. So, like, you know, if they're playing that level of game consistently where they're just running over the other teams, like, you know, it'll be full effort and full marks to opponents if they actually do win against the Flames. Well, a team that is running over their opponents right now is the Stockton Heat, our farm team. And we won't delve too far into this, but just to let everyone know how their season's starting, after losing their first two games, the Stockton Heat went on to win eight games in a row, which is pretty spectacular in the AHL, before Saturday night losing 4-2 to the Manitoba Moose. Uh, they now lead the AHL's Canadian division. So good to see the young guys down there getting the success, learning the success. Um, you know, Kale, Kale McLean, the head coach, coaching that team well. And, and I think in some ways it makes it harder when you want to call guys up because you don't want to disturb that. But I would rather those guys get a taste of winning at the AHL level before we call them up next year. Yeah. And, like, uh, frankly, guys like Pospisil, who's been doing rather well, and Rushitsko, who's been doing rather well, y- you almost want them to bask in success before taking that next step and like well, and that's Frank, why i think you're seeing like brett ritchie called up yeah and like the flames have enough good decent guys like how would you say like if they needed to pospisil could play as a fourth line winger and rujitska could be a fourth line center tomorrow and like if the flames weren't deep they probably would be right now but we have a bunch of guys that can do those jobs very effectively so we don't need them to and you know it's a very good problem to have good prospects coming up and it'll be interesting to see if Pedersen and Phillips can take that next step on the offensive side of things and become like the next Mundipane or Dubé we'll see and it's a good problem to have, like especially with the Flames' lack of high-end draft picks over the last handful of seasons. Um, the fact it's always that Stock- easier to develop when you're winning. Yeah, and like Stockton having as many good depth picks, like I, I think Pospisil was a fifth-round pick, Rajitsko was a fourth, uh, Phillips and Pedersen were both in the sixth. Like if you're getting legitimately good potential NHL prospects. Um, out of that like that's just an awesome bonus on top of things like i remember back when like guys with like house or wall or nemitz were you know they were playing first round picks that weren't doing anything yeah and so like if we're getting this level of production out of fourth fifth sixth seventh round picks like that's huge for this organization it really shows a different drafting philosophy under the current gm yeah Matt, with that, that comes to our weekly predictions. Neither of us did well last week. You went for the three wins under uh, the win with um, Huska and then two under Daryl Sutter, and I went with the loss-win-loss. This week, we've got a lot of Flames hockey. We have four games in the docket. Monday night at 7 p.m., the Oilers are here in Calgary taking on the Flames. Wednesday night, the Oilers are here again. That's a later start at 8 p.m. 
Then there's a back-to-back, both in Toronto, both 5 o'clock starts, Friday at 5 and Saturday at 5, and that gives us the next week of Flames hockey. Do you want to predict this one first? Win, 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 win. Four you think wins. so? Yep, six-game winning streak. You know that if you predict that, that means we're going to go on a four-game losing streak. No, Daryl's got them going. Um, he won't I tolerate think- that kind of stuff. <laughs> Out of that, or they go on a four-game losing streak, and Daryl gets canned already because it's well, you weren't giving us what we thought. Where's Brent? Next setter up. Yep. Oh, um, Brian, what are you doing? That's Rich, right. Hey, you're somewhere in the cell, don't. Who's 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 the one that never made it to the NHL? Gary. 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 Gary yep. You come try your hand at this. Yep. I'm not going to go as optimistic. I think these are really going to be telling games for the Flames, though, this week. I think with Edmonton and Toronto both ahead of us, it really shows us what the Flames have, playing teams that we could argue if they're better or not, but they are higher in the standings. So I think this is really going to show us what the Flames have. I think the Flames are going to win the first game against Edmonton, lose the second game against Edmonton, um, and then I think that we'll probably get... um, the first win against Toronto and lose the second one because they don't do well in back-to-backs mostly. So I'm going to go, uh, we're going to play 500 hockey this week. Win, win, loss, win, loss. Yeah. And I think that, like, at a minimum, the Flames need to do that this week. Like, at a bare minimum, 500. If but, the Flames uh, have to play well in two and not all four, I'd rather they play well against Toronto and then ride that momentum into Ottawa. Yeah, and I'd almost rather, you know, because Edmonton's more catchable, I'd rather them win both against Edmonton if... Like, if you can only pick two, like, I'd prefer both against Edmonton. But ideally, you know, we'd win at least three. Well, and Daryl Sutter came in, I mean, he didn't start his job until the 8th, but he was hired um, on, or announced as hired on, on the 4th, and his big thing was we got to beat Edmonton. Right, we have to beat the Oilers. He understands that rivalry. So I think he's going to make sure for that game tomorrow night on the 15th that these guys are ready to go. Yeah, and I think the especially like with the Flames, like if they play like they have against Montreal, then the work ethic Edmonton's not as deep as Montreal is. Like yeah, they have the two really shiny superstar awesome guys, but the whole team is kind of bad beyond that. It, like Paul Yarvi is start of a, sort of starting to emerge a bit as a player. Nugent Hopkins is kind of there, but uh, everything else is kind of just spare parts. And, and I don't even so, know if it's work at the game seven. I think it's how well we can keep them away from our net. Yeah, and like that's where, uh, like, can you keep McDavid? off his game? Like, if the Flames can buzz him in the defensive zone. And, you know, not give him the time and space to do things. You know, I think that would be good. And, like, if they can limit that those guys to, like, a goal or less, then they should be fine. It's, you know, you, you just can't let them run over. But I don't really foresee the Flames having much issue with that. I think that just due to Sutter's game management, I don't see them really allowing like things to get too out of hand we'll see what happens there i i think they're gonna play well in all four games i just don't know if they're gonna get four wins yeah well and that's also like my thoughts like i think they're gonna play very well and i'm just deferring to well, I, I think hey. you could get a point in i i think you get a point in three of these games i don't know which three but i think you'll, you could very well get at least a point in all three um or in three of the four, I mean. But I just I think it's very ambitious to to win all four. Yeah. Well, like basically the way I look at this week is adequate would be going five hundred. Yep. Like it, it's okay. And I think too, uh, when we say adequate, it might be good to lose because since you learn more by losing. So as long as we're seeing them building on the right steps and they don't fall apart, that loss could be a good building block for the next game. Yeah, and. Like, a good week is them winning three, and them winning four basically helps to reset the clock for all the BS that has happened. Because, like, like, if they walk in at the end of the week with 37 points, like, you're in a playoff spot, probably. And 
you know, like you're ne- starting to nip at the heels of those that are above you. So, like it, it just like that's why I, like I, I think that like the onus it, over the next couple of weeks is win as many damn games as possible. <laughs> well, if you look at it, we play for the rest of the month. I mean, we we talked about Vancouver or uh, Edmonton, Toronto this week. Then we have two games against Ottawa next week. Then three against Winnipeg, and then one against Vancouver. So outside of the Ottawa game. Everybody that we're playing here, and let's say the one Vancouver, everyone we're playing is ahead of us. So these are teams we not only need to get points from, but we need to keep from getting points. Yeah, and like that's where, like uh, how I was saying earlier, where like yeah, I think that the Flames could possibly break over and like still win the division if it was a normal setup in a season where like we were playing everybody. Then like no hope. Uh, like it would be basically hope to get fourth and you know maybe push for third but you know because of the fact that you have like if the flames go on a real roll and are like winning like say 20 of the 28 like you're depriving those teams of points in those 20 games and it just makes your job a lot easier but you have to actually go out and do that. And and, and I think that's going to be the big key going forward is not so much us winning games as us keeping everybody else where we can from getting points. I yeah. mean, when I look at this month, if I say – if I had to pick two games for us to drop, it would be the Ottawa games because they don't directly affect those standings, right? We need to be winning against the playoff teams. Yeah, and basically everybody. Like, that's why, like, if the Flames are going to have their, you know, yearly seven-game winning streak – to just you know now this the is the absolute perfect time to just both reset the system reset the year get on a roll and you know be in a playoff spot and okay yeah we're we're gunning for toronto at that point but remember that every year when they have a winning streak they also have a losing streak yeah well you know daryl's like yeah don't do that <laughs> oh that's all it took just tell us not to do that thanks daryl yeah, well... Nobody's told us that before. Well, you know... <laughs> Daryl's intimidating. <laughs> he just has to give you that Daryl look when somebody says, what if we were going on a losing streak? You're going to go work on my farm. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe that's the incentive. Hey, if we're not in the playoffs, you guys are going to come, you know, sow hay and, you know, sow seeds and whatever for a month instead of going golfing. I'm going to keep working you until the Stanley Cup is won. Yep. Whether it's on the ice or in the field. Yep. Shovel the <laughs> various shovel places the, out. Shovel the manure. Get up Get yep. up early and, you know, plant the seeds, cut the grass. You guys are going to keep working, whether it's on the ice or on the farm. Yep. And, you know, you'll see everybody skating just that much faster. <laughs> you, you, you get to pick your own destiny. Yep. All right, Matt. Well, let's get out of here. Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.